project over the last few weeks has been getting our garden back into some semblance of organized chaos, along with non-native peonies and hydrangeas, which I love. I've been planting native and pollinator friendly plants over the past few years. And although I'm getting really good at recognizing some of them, I'm still less good at recognizing others, especially when they're just sprouting. The problem with any garden, including a garden with lots of native plants that really don't require much water or work, is that until those plants are really established, you have to keep out weeds and invasive non-native species, some of which are quite pretty and don't look like weeds. And I had not done this for a couple of years. So I spent several days digging out a prolific weed whose name I don't know, but which has two different subtypes, at least, that sprout all over our yard. I pulled grass out as delicately as I could from between coneflower and milkweed and Ozark blue star and helenium, and I'm pretty sure I dug up some things that I actually wanted to keep, but it was impossible to tell them apart from the weeds. As I was yanking up some for sure weeds, I realized I'd taken a handful of foam flower leaves, a shade plant I most definitely wanted to keep, but at least I hadn't dug out the root. I know this will be a project for the rest of the summer, especially since invasive smart weeds, weeds creep from my neighbor's yard and their tree of heaven spreads saplings that sprout all over my garden. These plants were brought over from Asia by some well-meaning gardener, but they offer little to no nutrition for local wildlife and take over wherever they are not checked. To me, these particular weeds are evidence of the pervasiveness of Genesis 128 in our culture. God blessed the humans and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. That idea and impulse that we should subdue the earth and have dominion over it, that we should control the world around us, that is something that has led to people attempting to grow the unhappiest palm trees on earth right here in Michigan. A fad that went out of style, thankfully, about 20 years ago, I think. It's led to widespread pesticide use. It's led to the idea that we should keep and maintain lush green lawns without a hint of clover or creeping Charlie. Our effort in maintaining a prim, tidy yard with difficult plants could be held up as proof that we are the best at subduing the earth. That drive to control seeps into every part of our lives, not just our surroundings, but our bodies, ourselves, who we love and who we are. But in all that effort to prove we can conquer nature, have we missed out on acknowledging that nature is already good, that we are already good, that in fact, God has even gone so far as to call the world and us very good. And who are we to question that goodness? This is Trinity Sunday, and today's readings proclaim God's promises from the dawn of creation through the end of time. In the beginning, God created earth and all, all that is in it, called all of it, all of us, very good. Paul writes those familiar words that the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of us. And Jesus, standing on the mountain with 11 disciples, some of whom doubted, even though they were literally standing right there, tells us, tells those very imperfect, earnest disciples, those disciples who show up even when they're not sure about all this, that they are equipped to share God's love and good news with the whole world, welcoming God's beloveds with a gift and covenant of baptism, a promise of God for God's people. And then Jesus promises to be with them and with us always to the end of the age. It seems to me like often we miss the forest for the trees and focusing on how much we should subdue and have dominion, we have forgotten how good God's creation already is that instead of trying to bring everything under our unquestioned control as if we were tyrants, we are instead called to live in harmony and care for God's earth and all that is in it, including ourselves. Kate Bowler writes, We are people to be loved, not problems to be fixed. And a large number of our problems in this world come from our impulse to control it. But what if we saw ourselves the way God sees us, as beloved, and as part of the beloved creation God spoke into being. 
I believe today's Genesis reading and today's Gospel reading are two of the most misused texts in the Bible, though there are a lot of them where they give us an invitation to community and care of the other, we have instead seen a commandment to dominate and control. Just as we have tried to grow plants in places where they simply aren't evolved to belong, we have tried to take Jesus's invitation to baptism as a way to control. And the big C church has done this to the detriment of the whole world by baptizing by coercion or force. But baptism is a sacrament and a covenant, a promise between God and God's beloved, one that never ends, one that echoes Jesus's proclamation that he will be with us always. It was always meant to be an instrument of inclusion, not of coercion. We enter baptism not to be like everybody else, but to live into our full selves as God's beloved creations, knowing that God promises to journey with us to the end of the age. This world is not always an easy place to live, but it is beautiful and it is beloved. And you are a part of it, part of God's world, part of the story of resurrection and hope that gives each of us a place to be who God has made us to be. We've been called very good by the one who made us, who came to be with us, and who promises to be with us always.